Welcome. I'm Dr. Mindy Macant, a theology professor and the director of the Living Well Center for Vocation and Purpose at Lenore Ryan University in Hickory, North Carolina. The Living Well Center began a speaker series two or three years ago called Lives Worth Living. Pastor and author John Pavlovitz was scheduled to be our kickoff speaker for the 2020-2021 academic year, but with COVID-19, we've had to reschedule everything, and John has been great, has been gracious enough to agree to do this with me online instead. So welcome, John. The question I've asked you to think out loud with us about is, what is it that makes for a life worth living? Well, thank you so much for having me today, Mindy. It's, a, it's an honor to be with you virtually. Um, you know, I've been a pastor in the local church for 28 years, and during that time, I have been exposed to such a vast expanse of humanity. And as I began traveling the country over the past four or five years, I started asking people a question. I would ask them the question, what kind of person does the world need? and began sort of documenting their answers in very general, but in very specific ways. And I was looking for the patterns that they would share with me and the words like compassion and generosity and gratitude and creativity and courage. And these words kept coming up and then people would share stories that they may have seen where those, those things were being lived out by people in the way that it was inspiring them or challenging them. And so when I asked them that question, I would then follow up with, well, tell me about your life. Tell me about the space in which you live, the circles in which you travel, the community that you're a part of. And they would tell me some of their stories. And, and then I would be able to tell them, whatever you see as the gap in the world, that's the place you're being called to fill because that's where the burden is. That's where the passion is. And I, I, I hear that word compassion a lot and the, the, Beginnings of that word were tied to the word bowels, strangely enough, because it was the idea that the deepest emotions were housed near our vital organs. And I love that sort of idea with compassion tied to bowels because there was a phrase that said that we're twisted in our bowels by what we see. And we know that people's stories of suffering, they move us. And so I, I love the idea that compassion is actually a movement. And that's really a powerful idea because I think you can look at the burdens, look at the things that really keep you up at night, the things that cause you to, um, to be disheartened and then lean into those things because those are invitations to do what only you can do because you're specifically positioned and qualified to, to express something that is in aid of that. And so that's really the work that I do. It's, I don't see myself as a pastor primarily or an author, but as a collector of stories, as sort of a war correspondent. And I get on the ground in a new city and I say, I get into the trenches and say, tell me what's happening here on the ground so I can tell the folks back home. And people give me access to their lives, to proximity, to their pain. They give me, you know, the deepest um, grief that they have and they share with me their fears and their worries. And that's the, a really beautiful space because that is exactly where transformation of communities happen. It's not in the big picture necessarily. It's in the small and the close. And so that's what I do. I try to distill those conversations down and say, what are those people trying to tell me? And then I write those things. And so that's a lot of the work that I do is helping people see where's my burden and how am I specifically positioned to enter into that burden. Thank you. I love the um, I love the language of filling in the gaps um, between what you uh, what kind of person you think the world needs and what you see. That's actually a really pretty image um, and a powerful image to me of filling in those gaps that you see and that being somehow or another connected to your calling. I know you you write a lot about the role of Christians in in filling in the gaps. I wonder if you might say a little bit more about how your faith has shaped um, how you understand what that looks like in your own life. Sure. You know, part of my journey was I didn't grow up wanting to be a pastor. I had no aspirations for ministry at all and would have considered myself in my college years to be a hopeful agnostic. And what happened was I began volunteering for a church in my 20s and, and sort of evolved into 
full-time volunteer and then part-time, you know, paid ministry. And then I finally left my secular career to go into ministry full-time. But I went in with, with a very different mindset than many pastors or ministers might. And I, I began to see that there was a disconnect between the, the church and the teachings of Jesus that I was becoming more and more um, in love with. And so I saw that there was sort of a, a choice I had to make as a pastor often that I could be partially authentic or I could be an unemployed pastor. And because the church in some ways can perpetuate um, prejudice, it can just um, perpetuate a lot of the systems that we see in America that are problematic. So for me, it was the, uh, the reckoning with that and then trying to say, how can I pull a group of people to a healthier version of spirituality, to a religion that is actually much more expansive in the people that it sees and hears and respects? And so that's a lot of the, the my sort of um, my mission field is the, the white evangelical church, because I had served largely in churches in the South. And, and saw that there were so many blind spots and so many disconnects between the gospel stories and what the church was sort of doing and being in, especially in America right now. So I just try to hold up those stories that I learned and that sort of theology of compassion, that um, apologetic of love and say, do we look like this? Are people of vulnerable, oppressed, marginalized communities, are they experiencing that when they experience Christianity? And the answer is often no. And so why is that so? Thank you. You actually uh, ended with exactly the question I was going to then ask you to say a little bit more about. You do write a good bit about uh, things of um, kind of fraught, in our fraught political environment, you're very outspoken about the relationship between politics and faith and inclusivity um, and diversity. Uh, and, and I wonder if you might say a little bit more about that right now? Well, I think what many people have been raised and the people in my churches were, I saw that they were raised for decades in uh, a toxic or unhealthy image of God. And so I, I often say that the, the problem is, is that people's God is actually too small because their God is, tends to resemble them and the things that, that are important to them, but also, you know, results in reflecting their fears and their biases and their prejudices. And so I'm always trying to pull people into that kind of wider understanding of what God is and how that kind of wider understanding should manifest itself in the ways that we treat people and even in the legislation that we support, even in the causes that we're part of. And so right now there seems to be so much coalescing around the, the political situation in America because you've got ideas about uh, immigration, you've got ideas about health care, you've got the environment, and so many of these things, they're spiritual issues, they're deeply um, part of the fabric of our belief system. So the question becomes, what do I actually believe? When I look at my life and how I spend my time and my energy and how I vote, what does that say about what I value on the deepest levels? And I'm, I'm quite, you know, convinced now that the divide that we have in our country is not political. And it's not, you know, Republican versus Democrat. It's not uh, even conservative Christians versus progressive Christians. It's really a vision divide, a, a divide in how we see ourselves and community and the world and, and then how we're responding because of that. So how do you, I mean, you use the language at the beginning for thinking about your own vocation of filling in the gap. And then um, and what you just said, which I think you're right, actually, that the gap isn't isn't quite as much uh, it's not as simplistic as we sometimes want to make it a Republican or Democrat or liberal or, or progressive. Um, how do you have any sense of how we go about bridging that gap? I mean, not just on the personal like my vocation may be to fill the gap that I see personally in needs of compassion or generosity or whatever, but how do we on a more collective and communal scale bridge this gap rather than just filling it in individually? Well, part of the, the thing, I, I think community is such a powerful force and it's really medicinal for us. We can mm -hmm. begin to get around what I call like-hearted people. We don't have to agree on everything, but we have some philosophical ideas about what is good and true and right. And then what we do is we get with those people and we create something that is unmistakable, something that other people can see. 
because when you're in a small minded religion or, a, or when you're in a God that is undersized, let's say, mm -hmm. you, you sort of lose imagination on what is possible. And that's what I see even in the, in the protests as they've gone on here in America, you, you saw something that people could look at from the outside and say, oh, now I, I think I see it. And so community getting with people, and that means transcending your political affiliations and your religious traditions and many of the qualifiers that we use to divide people and say, what can we do together? Because I think when people are working alongside one another on something that they all believe in, the differences in them be become something that's beautiful rather than something that hinders them. And so, you know, in my ministry life, that was something I was always trying to do. Let's do something together so that we forget these sort of um, smaller battles that we're fighting. And let's look at what can we do as shared humanity? Because that's the point. That's what we're here to do is to alter the moral arc of the universe while we're here. Great. Thank you. Um, kind of a last question to think about is if you were to try to, Imagine you have in front of you, because this is if we if you've been able to come, what we would have is a room full of 20 somethings. So pretend you're sitting in front of a bunch of 20 year olds um, who who are trying to figure out um, who it is they're called to be, what it is they're called to do in the world um, and what do they do next? And and the world has shifted. I mean, the, that was a hard enough question if you were 20 years old 20 years ago. It was an even harder question a year ago. I can't imagine being 20 today and having to navigate that. So I wonder what thoughts or advice um, or challenges or whatever you might offer. Um, again, it would be easier if they could actually converse with you, but imagining them here in front of you, what, what kinds of things might you say to, to a room of 20 year olds? Well, I think back to when I was that age, and those were years that were very turbulent for me. Um, they were, you know, I was so, doing so much wrestling, and I couldn't even figure out hour to hour sort of what I wanted my life to be about. But it sounds so trite, but I tell people that there is power in your story, and there's resonance in your voice. Because whether you are a person who believes that we are here by a series of random chances, or you believe that there is an intelligent creator who placed you here, either way, you're a once in history, never to be repeated creation with thoughts and gifts and talents and experiences that no one has ever had. And so it's important that you value those things, that you speak from the most authentic places and that you express the fears and worries that you have because there are always going to be places where people can meet you. My story has been the moment I started giving voice to my, my deepest convictions and my greatest fears that's when the community of affinity came and said, oh, I'm asking those questions too. And we began living out life together. So what's beautiful is there's so much that you don't know, but once you begin to express those questions and give voice to those passions, you're going to have community built around you that you couldn't anticipate right now. You can't see those people. So you sort of create that community and that community informs you, gives you better questions. And then you find your purpose in that community. Power in your story and resonance in your voice. I love that. Um, thank you very much. I think that's actually um, a really perfect place to, to end. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, for agreeing to come, for, for meeting me through this odd medium of Zoom. Um, and uh, I hope very much that uh, we're able to actually have you back on campus once once we're able to open things up and meet in larger numbers. Um, so thank you very much. Well, it, it will be a joy to be with you uh, when that happens. Thank you so much. Thank you.